and we're still not coming in. Hello, everybody. And thank you for joining us. My name is Jim Hoko, and I am the Executive Director for the Behavior Analyst Leadership Council. The BALC is a trade organization. We were founded in 2015. We're committed to supporting behavior analysts serving as leaders, managers, and business owners. And I'm happy to report again that we are going to Miami in March of 2022, from between March 2nd and 5th. And we have a bit more information today. We have a list of confirmed speakers including Ivy Chong, Adrian Bradley, Neil Martin, Lonnie Fritz, Bob Ross, Tyra Sellers, Deborah Napolitano, Bob Ross, Deborah Sivierge, and Mark Palmieri. And our keynote speaker is going to be John Austin. We're very happy to have John as the keynote speaker. So if you want to come, engage, learn, network, and relax with your colleagues, join us at the beautiful Hyatt Regency located steps from Miami Riverwalk, close to the Port of Miami, the Brickell City Center, Bayside Marketplace, and Little Havana. So please note that this live presentation will be presented and available for viewing at a later time to enable viewers of the recorded version to collect continuing education units. The speakers or moderator will be inserting participation words at a few points during the presentation. Those viewing the recording will need to submit those words for verification of participation. Uh, submission of the words is required for only people watching the recorded version. So if you're watching it today on June 10th, 2021, you do not need to do that. Uh, to earn the CU, CUs, you're going to watch the session, note the participation words, email. Uh, we have a change in email, ceu at balcllc.org with your name, your BACB number, the webinar title, the participation words. And after a little bit of technical difficulty, I want to introduce our speaker for tonight, Shala Ali Rosales. Hey, Shala, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> Got your Got your video on. Um, I have to tell people that we have had probably the worst technical issue of our entire series for Shala's presentation. We weren't even ready to go until a couple of minutes before. It wasn't our fault. It was a technical issue on the platform side, but that's why we're a little bit flustered today. But I am so happy to, uh, to have my friend Shala here today. Shala is the Associate Professor of University of North Texas. She's held positions as a project director of UNT Autism Project. She's the director, has been the director of research and development from Easter Seals out of North Texas Autism Program. She's had numerous publications, grants and contracts and over 200 professional papers, workshops and presentations. And she's going to be doing our finale to our Supervision for Success series. And we're very happy to have her. So without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Shala. And Shala, you are still muted. <laughs> I am delighted to be here today, and despite all the technical errors or difficulties we've had, um, I think that I am honored and privileged to be closing this series. Um, I, I also want to say I am so fond and have such respect for all my previous uh, presenters, and I hope I hope today you find as useful as the past sessions. Today will be a little bit different, um, and I will explain a little bit of why. Um, first of all, let me say that I have three specific objectives today. The first one is to help you identify a context for considering cultural responsiveness in your practice and in your supervision. To identify some of the tensions and possibilities that are related to our field. Um, and then to also talk about some pathways and some sample activities that you can engage in that will help you become more responsive within our diverse climate. I also have some hopes in addition to our objectives. Um, this has been a journey for me. It's been a journey probably from birth because I, I was born into a very culturally diverse family, but learning the scholarship and 
how to approach this in a systematic and heartfelt way is a process. And that's part of what I wanna share with you today. I also work um, in interdisciplinary teams with people from all different disciplines. And it has been important to me to learn concepts, vocabulary, look at data from outside of our discipline to help progress in this way. And most importantly, I hope that you will consider your role in affecting generational change and betterment in our field. So with that, uh, I also wanna say two things. In your packet, I've given you a copy of the PDF of this talk and several articles, and I've given you two pages of discussion and activities that you can engage in after the talk if you're interested. So as you go through, as I go through the presentation, you'll see these little stars here, and each one corresponds with something in the follow-up activity. I also want to say that I am going to be covering sensitive content, content. And I believe it will be particularly sensitive for people who have experienced trauma related to culture, related um, to equity and to an inclusion. So feel free to step back if you need to and to process things. The first thing I'd like to start out with is to say that supervision is a relationship. Um, and that relationship is evolving. It is a dynamic relationship that will change over time. And I'll talk about some of the ways that changes. But one or three things that that relationship, uh, three characteristics are, first of all, you should have a shared mission to improve outcomes of the people that you're serving, whether you're a supervisee or a supervisor. And you should have some shared goals about improving skills and knowledge and the best of supervisors. This is something Linda and Tyra and I talk about in our book. The best of supervisors are also in that growing and learning process. And finally, there's some shared intention about the supervision process that there's agreement that you want to do better. There's also a shared ethical foundation about the ways that are helpful and not helpful to do better. And there is a shared commitment to responsiveness to one another and to the people that we're serving. And above all, supervisors have generational impact. So what you do as a supervisor with your supervisees will affect not only that supervisee, but will affect generations of behavior analysts in practice. So what I would like to do today is talk with you about how to develop generationally responsible relationships in the context of these times that we live in, which are complicated times. I'm gonna talk first about our global context. There is a global divide that is occurring in our world. I'm yes. sorry for interrupting. Yes. But we're seeing the presenter slide and I don't think the slides are moving it. So I think okay. you might've shared the wrong view okay let me <laughs> let me see this is off. just the theme for tonight we're just going to embrace it and keep moving right that's okay um hold on a second it is closing it well um let me figure out what's going on um i am so sorry well let me while i'm while I'm reopening the document, let me tell you a little bit about what I'm going to say there. What we have is a global divide. And in that global divide, uh, what is happening is we see disparities, especially in four particular areas. The areas that we see disparities are first um, in, uh, here, I've got it back up again, and I am going to attempt to Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so I'm going to go back to share. Do you see my screen? Build the presenter's view. Yeah, yeah, no, but I mean, you're seeing it. I'm seeing it, yes. Okay, now what are you seeing? Hold on. I'm still seeing presenter view. 
Okay, can you see my slides? Because it's not in presenter view in mine. I'm not really sure what to do. We, we can see. <laughs> I'll, we can. I'll, stop, I'll stop share again. Um, <laughs> are, you, uh, are you running off of two screens, Shola? No, I'm not. I'm, okay. I'm wondering why that's, that's happening then. I don't know. Um, can you see, can, can everybody see the slide well enough to follow what I'm saying? Except for when you're, if you've moved through slides, it's not moved. Okay, so, um, gosh, I, I don't really know what to do. <laughs> um, except maybe I should log off and log back on again. Um, did you close PowerPoint down? Yeah. Why don't we try it one more time before we have to do that? Um, okay. Start um, your presentation again. Okay. I am so sorry, everyone. Uh, it may not be, it may be this other problems that we're having with the platform right now. Okay. I'm, I'm doing everything I normally do. Um, maybe if I share my desktop instead. Let's do that. Let me try that. And now go to the main. How is that? Yes, that's better. And okay. if you maximize it. Okay, how is that? That is good, Shala. Okay. We are adaptable, so if nothing else, right? We are adaptable. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me get perfect. Back to the you're you're let me, looking let me good. Get back to the I'm global. I'm going to stop supply. interrupting you. Bye. <laughs> okay, and I am going to have to um because I I think that you're seeing my picture there in the corner. Um, okay. how's that? Okay, so what we have is a global divide. Um, and and this impacts what's happening with our services, it impacts the people we work with, and it impacts our supervisees. So I want to briefly introduce that context. For example, what we saw during the pandemic is we saw children who had access to technology and they had access to adults who could help them through the educational process. And you may not be aware of it, but there are many children who were receiving no education or very little education and didn't have access to the same thing. The same thing was happening in healthcare. We have people who have the highest technology, state of the art, medical services to help them survive and to live during this period. We had people around the globe and in our own communities that were having triage and less than substandard care. The same thing with housing. In this same square footage, we have two people and all the people that serve them in one area. You look at another place in the world and there are thousands of people living in the same square footage in substandard conditions. The same thing was true. Many of us were thinking about how we could get to our, famous, our favorite restaurants during the pandemic, five-star restaurants. And at the same time, many people were without food um, and, and the basic elements for nutrition uh, for their children. What also happened during this period and has been happening is that social justices that have occurred have been made visible. We saw across the board um, many things happen, largely due to social media, but those kinds of things that were made visible also affect the people we're working in, our communities, and our supervisees. And things like children being in cages are still occurring in our, in our country and across the world. While all of this is happening and we become aware of the disparities, the lack of access, the injustices, voices are also rising of people who are from those communities that have been marginalized or underrepresented in the past. And this has been a really good thing because we have been able to hear what those difficulties are. We've been able to see them and people have been able to understand that there is something that we have to do as a global community. So those voices of social change are telling us things and we are telling ourselves, we are all learning 
that social justice has become a moral imperative. We want to prevent, to avoid, to remediate unfair distributions. We also look at this as a constructive paradigm. This is not just to stop bad things, but it's to imagine and build a better world and a more inclusive world. The well being, the suffering of one individual is viewed in the context of all of us, of the entire human collective. So what we've come to understand is we're an interconnected global community and that developing cultural responsiveness may help increase our collective well-being. When I talk about culture today, I'm largely relying on definitions by Sugai and colleagues, as well as Lynch and Hansen. And basically, um, cultural groups can be identified by other people or groups, or they can be self-identified and they can be classified in many different ways. And one thing that is important to understand is, I like this quote, cultures are like organisms. They grow, change, adapt, and evolve. So I've been a member of two cultures. I've lived in a third. I married into a fourth and I try to exist in a fifth. And that all changes depending on other parts of my identity. But members of cultural groups tend to engage in behavior that reflects a shared learning history. There's some kind of conditioning process that's very similar for groups of people. And they tend to engage in behavior that differentiates those groups across different conditions. And often, and this is very important when we're thinking about supervision and provision of services, often there are different stated values or priorities across groups. So there are a lot of different ways of looking about how to respond to our interconnectedness and how to become better working together. And there have been discipline, disciplines grappling with this for a long time. And the continuum goes everything from cultural destructiveness, groups who actually want to harm another group. And we see that in the world today. I think in general, when we look at people in our field, that is not what we see. Um, when you move along the continuum, there's incapacity, not being able to help. There's unawareness, which people also call this cultural blindness, where you think, oh, culture doesn't make a difference. Your conditioning history and groups shouldn't matter. There's also sensitivity and competence, a growing awareness that you have weaknesses and you want to improve your services and get buy-in from other groups. And then there is cultural responsiveness, which came largely out of the field of education. And here the concept is there's, an, there's a commitment to inclusion and social justice is actually the goal of cultural responsiveness. Learning and transforming are the basic concepts. And there is a upfront acknowledgement that there are power and resource disparities. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to examine one area of our responsiveness in early and intensive behavioral interventions. And this has to do with practice where your supervisees are working. And because this has been my area of practice, I have known it most intimately and I feel like it was the best area for me to interface in this issue. You may have other areas that your supervisees are working in and I invite you to do the same thing. And I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly um, because of our time constraints and also um, to make sure I can get to the suggestions about how to work with this. But I want to say that this isn't part of the checklist or the recipe or the guidance about what you should do with your supervisees. This is part of the foundational knowledge to understand something about how our structures are, are designed and function right now. So first of all, we have over 50 years of strong evidence about the effectiveness of early and intensive interventions. We have some seminal studies and there's a whole bunch of research strands that show in general, children with autism can make a lot of progress um, if they are in an intervention program very early and if it's configured a particular way. So this kind of intervention is very, very difficult. Um, I've been doing it for 30 years. I've watched the literature develop and it is not an easy thing to do, even when the cultural conditions are very similar. The topographies, the functions and the meaning of the core features of what we call autism are defined and shaped by specific cultural communities. You couldn't pick three things that intersect across culture more than those. 
So the first question I ask myself is, who informs our interventions? Researchers, editorial boards, professors like me, directors, regulating bodies like the BACB, funding agencies, all the insurance companies, and to some degree, the children and families. All of that research over the 50 years, except with one exception, or actually two exceptions, have been done in a primarily uh, Western culture. And there's even a name for this in psychology and in, um, and in the research and scholarship looking at science and how science um, is predominantly embedded in and WEIRD stands for Western Educated Industrial Rich and Democratic Context. So I'm not gonna read these quotes, but what I wanted to show you by having these here is it's not just us. This is across all the sciences and all the humanities, realizing that one dominant culture has been the shapers and the informers of how we approach things. In fact, this was a panel that the BACB had, and it's a beautiful panel, the Fathers of Applied Behavior Analysis. I added LOVAS because that is part of who informed what we do in autism intervention. And if you look at it, you will see a lovely group of people, many of them, some of them my teachers, gym teachers, um, who we learned a lot from. But this is really one group of people. They share very similar characteristics. There's a little bit of religious diversity, but beyond that, it's pretty much a group of older white men from the West. Well, let's look at the next question. What is the content of EIB? The emphasis is on the childhood practices of one culture. And in fact, some of the data, some of the studies coming out are showing that it's, it's incongruent with some cultures. It's important to understand that when we talk about those cultural groups and the conditioning, the cultural differences begin really early. And I'm going to very quickly summarize some of the work of Heidi Keller and her colleagues. And there are many other people doing research in, in this area of cross-cultural psychology. But what she did, and I found impressive, she and her colleagues looked at five very different cultures. And across those cultures, they watched them over time and they actually went in and observed. They, they had time samples and they looked at how mothers and infants were interacting. And there were really big differences. On one end of the continuum, there were parents very lovingly that turned their babies outwards and said things like map, light, moon, they did a lot of labeling. And another culture that turned the other end of the continuum that turned their babies inward. And what they did is they did a lot of face-to-face, -face, a lot of cooling, a lot of back and forth. And in between cultures were doing variations of those. Of course, this is all mitigated by other things. And in terms of parents living in poverty, not in poverty, having uh, different uh, conditions that would change those uh, interactions. But in general, if you think about what I just said and think about most of our early intervention, we have a lot of emphasis on labeling, on feature form and function, turning the child outward. Not necessarily bad, but it's very specific to one culture. So what happens and what people look at within these areas outside of behavior analysis that study culture is that all these ways I have on the screen, as human beings in our different groups, we've learned different ways to respond to things like kinship, our relationships with our families, roles regarding respect, the funds of knowledge, um, how we protect our children, what children need protecting. You know, one of, one of the things we hear about is how people have to talk to their children about driving while black. Some people have those conversations, some people don't. Um, you know, even if you think about one of the first families I had in our, in our parent training program over 20 years ago, well, actually this family is probably 15 years ago, um, but one of the families came in and the mother came in with the son and then the grandfather and then a cousin and then one of the neighbors and then the sister. The training though, and our billing systems account for parent training. They don't account for the whole clan coming in. And I could tell you stories about each of these areas, but the important thing right now to understand is that you may walk into a situation and think that the history is the same as yours and think that the structures are, are going to be applied in the same way and received the same way and they're not. 
And then we add on to that, which I think is a very important movement right now, the autism rights movement, and what people who are autistic are saying about their culture and about the way that their neurodiversity changes the way they interact with the world. So the next question I asked is, who has access to EIBI? And is it access culturally congruent? And the answer is not everyone. Um, services, service access can be actually quite socially unjust and culturally unresponsive. Specific groups receive services at a later age. They get a different mix of services, and I'm going to show you some data about that. And even if people are getting access from those different cultural groups, the procedures and the content can be culturally incongruous, and at times, families report repellent. The issue related to this is that in most cases, and especially with our current funding systems and services, that it appears to some degree that health and ability are commodities and they're controlled and accessed by the privileged. If you don't have employment, you don't have insurance. Much of the insurance covered when you don't have employment doesn't cover our services. So there is a restriction of who is getting services under what conditions. And for the people we're supervising, that actually makes a difference in terms of who they are interacting with and how they respond, as well as their own histories and their own access. Part of this comes from a legacy of colonialism. This is one of the words I'm going to be introducing. Um, where, at least in this country, the codification of race meaning demarcation between the people who are conquering and the people being conquered, race was a very salient stimulus. So there was a separation of black and brown people and the labor and resources that became commodities were controlled by the conquerors or the fittest. So value has been given to the acquisition of resources, bodies and service, and your ability to be the fittest to survive. Along these lines, what I would like to do is talk a little bit about a couple of communities. So Ferguson is where Michael Brown was murdered, and I'm going to talk about what services look like there. So I did a little bit of Googling, and I'm going to show you a couple of cities. And basically, and, and there is a plan within companies to find the right locations that will serve the people who are wanting to be served. But this is the Del Mar divide here in the St. Louis region. This is Ferguson, where Michael Brown lived. This is East St. Louis, which has similar difficulties. And what you'll see is all the services are located in one area. Washington University, one of the top 25 universities in the country did research. And what they found um, was that African-American toddlers only 50% were receiving any services at all post-diagnosis. And of the children who were receiving interventions, the services were often lower in frequency, in amount and frequency. So what was being received was very different and access to those services is very different. It's not just Ferguson either. Similar data, if you look here in my own community, this is the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And what you see is this is a racial map that little teardrop and the surrounding areas are predominantly white neighborhoods. In Los Angeles, the LA Times reported they have regional center funding, not insurance funding primarily, but what they report is a very big difference, 11,000 for white children, 6,000 for black children. So how much do we address these issues in our, in our professional preparation? The answer is not much. Below and colleagues in just an incredibly useful uh, survey that really set the stage for many other surveys to take place, but they were particularly interested in training and practices regarding cultural diversity and culturally competent care. And they had all this in a table form because I'm really visual, I graphed it, um, but what what we see, which is no surprise, and also why I picked this area, aside from it being my area to look at, is that most of us are serving children with autism. You see that up in the top left-hand panel. And most of us are white. Um, there are some um, 
not described race and then some black and some Asian. And um, then when we look at the reported skill level, um, what we see is that the green is extremely skilled in culturally competent care and the blue is moderately skilled. So the majority of people at that time reported themselves as being extremely or moderately skilled in culturally competent care. The concern and the discrepancy is that most people reported no training at all or a little training. And for those of you who know um, about the acquisition of skills, one of the things that happens is early on, all of us, almost all human beings, I think, when we're starting to learn something, we don't know what we don't know. And what this reflects to some degree, I believe, is that we don't know what we don't know. And in fact, there is another layer of concern here. Uh, these graphs show age of diagnosis and number of children diagnosed in the lower left-hand corner, black, Hispanic, and white. And what you can see, there's a lag in diagnosis for black and Hispanic children, but late in life, they eventually uh, get diagnosed. So there's not a difference in the children that receive the, the autism diagnosis. But if you look at our leadership, this is, um, this is data released by the BACB. Um, what you see in these circle graphs is that the majority of the leadership, BCBAs, BCBADs, supervisors um, are white. Uh, we have some Hispanic, some black, and a very small number of American Indians and Asian and some people who didn't answer. At the same time, if you look at the RBTs, which are the people we're supervising and training in most cases, uh, there's a very large number that are Hispanic, a large number that are black, and about half that are white. I think what we will see is that proportion change over time. I hope the top one changes as well as the bottom one. So what Below and colleagues suggested is that training on working with individuals from diverse backgrounds is critically needed from our degree programs, from where I'm teaching, behavior analytic employers, you all, and continuing education providers. This is important for knowing about when we are supervising, who we are supervising, and what they are trying, trying to accomplish in what setting. Although that seems a little dismaying and a little bit, at least to me, of a fixed structure and a structure that mirrors what's happening in our world in terms of the split, I think that our discipline offers a lot of hope and possibility. I think what I have observed over time, what I've learned in my reading and behavior analysis is that the majority of people who get into this field, there is a strong negative reinforcement component. We want to alleviate suffering and injustice. We, we want, there's positive reinforcement. It gives us joy, happiness to produce well-being and progress. Having those reinforcers, I think, is on our side. It will help us move through this and figure out how to create both services and supervision, the generation of how those super services continue in a way that is inclusive and socially just. In fact, the heart of applied behavior analysis um, considers social importance and that that social importance in the context of today's world and looking at our generational impact has to include multiple and diverse vantage points. It has to be the people we are working with in our research, in our practice, and in our supervision. And then addressing goals that are important to the world, Montwell said this many years ago, is not unscientific, it's just really hard. Um, and that is what we're all grappling with at every level. And I'm gonna give you the first CE word. It is heart. So the first CE word is heart. The other thing that I think, in addition to our beautiful hearts and our motivation and um, the purpose of applied behavior analysis is we are trying really hard to learn. Um, there has been the most incredible uptick in our field uh, within the last five years. 
we have had special issues in perspectives on behavior science. We've had special issues in behavior analysis and practice. And we actually have a journal, Behavior and Social Issues, that since its inception in the 70s has been dedicated to these issues. And there is a long line of people who have been rapidly publishing things, trying to help everybody learn how to do this better. We also are learning how to act on guidance from our certification board. We have an ethics code now, which was the compliance code that has been up updated revised and strengthened in terms of this area. There are specific things in our code that talk about diversity, that talk about how to ensure our competence, that talk about our obligation to get help. We're also learning to value what is called um, outside of our field positionality and perspective. So the thing is, is when we look at cultural conditioning, each of our positions are defined in a cultural context. Our race, our ethnicity, class, religion, gender, sexuality, our physicality, our age. That affects how we experience the world. When all the speakers, like what I went over before, and the listeners in a particular discipline share the same dominant positions, that position becomes the default truth or standard. The more we are able to each talk about our, they call it enunciating positionality in, in the disciplines looking at this, the more we're able to do that, we can break domination-based relationships. We can expand our understanding of what truth is and objectivity, and we can invite more inclusive practices, more inclusivity in our practice and supervision efforts. There's also something called the Pantla pedagogy. And this is literally a, a pedagogy that is devoted to putting yourself in in-between spaces, being in places where it's uncomfortable. I work consistently with an applied anthropologist. Our epistemologies, our methodologies, our axiologies are often different. And we share in common that we want to improve the settings where we work and labor together but that, that in-between spaces is uncomfortable and one is very vulnerable. So this is actually a way of learning, putting yourself in those situations. And I'm gonna talk about that with our example exercises. Also learning to value inclusion, which seems sort of obvious, but there are some fundamental things about inclusion that we're all sacred and worthy, that we are interconnected and that we live in a particular time in history that has urgency. It requires a response to how we all, we all get together. The difficulty is the response is, is really not clear all the time. It almost never is. We have to learn as we're going along. So how do we learn to be responsive? It's important to understand that responsiveness means that we are quick. So there's, there's a fluency, a speed that we're building to react appropriately, and there's a sympathy. There is a feeling with the other person when we are responsive. Learning and responsiveness result in change. What we are before this is occurring and after will look very different. There's a big difference between a transformation and getting buy-in from your people that you're working with, the children, the families, and also your supervisees. It means there's a negotiation between the individuals, the culture, and the behavior analysts. It is multi-directional. There's a lot of intersections of learning. There's a lot of interactive perspective sharing, and there's a commitment to changing and doing what is better for everyone, and even talking about what better means. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna talk about several transformative practices and they are conceptualized within sort of a behavior analytic lens, you'll recognize this process. Um, and they are things that we've talked about in several publications. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you some example exercises that have at least helped us and that we have learned from our colleagues in other disciplines prove to be helpful.
So the first one is a really obvious one, but it's probably one of the hardest ones is you have to allocate. And, and you have to have a son who played basketball, but you have to have some skin in the game. If there are no resources dedicated to this specifically, if there's no time in the schedule, if there are no actions, no behavior, no effort, no reinforcers, you're not gonna make very much progress. The next thing is you have to create conditions. We know this is behavior analysts and creating conditions is not easy. I, I picked this picture because my uncle used to tell a story. Um, he worked in, in, in contexts where many people were trying to get along and, and uh, serve a common mission. And he said, you know, we are like gemstones. When you put us in the tumbler, we all look kind of all muddy and the same. And then you put, for those of you who know how gemstones are cleaned and shined, you put them in this tumbler and they rub up against each other. And it's probably, painful if they had feelings. What we are in the equivalent of doing right now is we have all this beautiful diversity, but we're tumbling and we're, we're in the process of that tumbling, being vulnerable, learning. Um, it, it's not always comfortable, it's oftentimes painful, but we, we're, we're becoming more beautiful and our diversity shows in all its beauty. So what we have to do as supervisors, directors, is create new learning opportunities, new stimulus controls, new reinforce, reinforcer controls that are wrapped around diversity, wrapped around inclusion. We have to introduce variations in perspective and ways of knowing and values. And that is not comfortable. We, we have had a discipline that broke off from another discipline and we have kept a very strong hold of fortress around the boundaries of it partly because there's been so much effective change, but there's gotta be a little negotiation, a little bit of permeability there to allow other ways of interacting with our behavior science. And while we're doing all of those really hard things, we have to create safe environments that cherish inclusion, that cherish learning, that cherish variability. Variability is very important in these efforts and courage because this is hard. The next thing, the third thing is we actually have to engage. You don't get behavior change without some behavior. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some ways to do that. We have some phenomenal colleagues and you can read these a little bit better in your handout, but in the special issues that are talking specifically about social justice, specifically about things related to the black community and police brutality and racism. We have people talking about the differences between cultures. Um, these are webinars that are available in our own field. And in fact, um, in two weeks, there's the Black Association for Behavior Analysis. They have a whole conference and this year's conference is dedicated to equity and inclusion. There is a phenomenal uh, eight hour training by Karina Jimenez and her colleague specifically on how to develop confidence, learn more in this area. There are incredible books, this book, Dignity, that talks about real difficulties in an area that people don't talk about in terms of poverty and class distinctions. Uh, there are community projects you can engage in where you will come into contact with different people. There are service projects. There is work, incredible. Ruha Benjamin is one of my favorites. She talks about the structural things that are happening, for example, in medicine, in the technology industry, that without us even knowing it, are setting us up to respond in ways that are in fact quite racist. I think one of the things in this action in going out into the world and, and learning and interacting with everyone above all is to be humble, um, which is hard. You start learning something and you think you know it, but this is a quote from a beautiful paper, which I gave you the reference for um, from, from Patricia Wright, who says that given the uneven power dynamic inherent in the service delivery model, our service delivery model, inspection and adjustments are necessary to ensure that optimal outcomes for the client are not inhibited by cultural bias. You can add in your supervisee and it's the same thing. This is not an area that will ever be mastered. It's an ongoing practice. 
In terms of your engagement, it's also important to understand the intersections of power and privilege. And this is particularly salient with supervisees. You are functioning in a system, particularly if you are above the line are areas of privilege. If you're credentialed, if you're young, if you're attractive, if you're upper and middle class, if you speak English without an accent, if you're light, if you're part of the majority uh, religion, even fertility, if you're fertile, um, if you're able-bodied, heterosexual, if you have a European descent rather than Middle Eastern and African, if you're white, if you're male, um, this doesn't necessarily mean life is good for you. It means that if you start out with these things, you start out with a different way of the world responding to you. So if you're in more or less these categories and your supervisees are in these categories, there's already a differential power imbalance that one has to be aware of. There is a whole area of scholarship around just this, but it's something to be aware of and to learn about as you're going through your supervision and your practice. So the fourth area, is to nurture and nourish. So you're doing all of those things and they're hard, they're uncomfortable, you're learning a lot. How do you keep that learning going and not have it be punished? So one of the most important ways to do this is to create learning communities that act for justice and inclusion. And Lila Watson is attributed to this quote I put here, but basically what she says is, you know, if you're coming here to help me because I'm a, in Spanish, you say pobrecito, um, you're wasting your time. But if you're coming here because we are interconnected and what is good for me will also be good for you, will be good for all of us, then let's go work together. So the idea here is get a community that can work together. There's a name for this actually in anthropology, it's a community of practice. And it's a group of people who specifically share a common interest or activity and they get together on a regular basis. They've allocated time and resources to meet and to talk about what they're learning, to reflect on that learning and to think about how they can do it better. So we look at culturally responsive supervision in our treatment centers and clinics, in our academic departments, in our labs where we do research, in our journals when we supervise how people publish, how they review, in our grants, everything, every area that we practice as behavior analysts and every area that we mentor and supervise the next generation will benefit from the community of practice. So one of the things that, or several things that a community of practice does for inclusive progress is it promotes growth and advancement towards the missions of inclusion and the missions of serving the people and producing a next generation is better. There are specific actions and reflections and then trying to improve. There are multiple participants. You need different people. You need those diverse, all those different rocks rubbing up against each other and making each other beautiful. And from different sectors, you need people from leadership, supervised, trainees, families, the community, all having a voice and helping everyone progress. We're all in the process of becoming. I, I can't stress this enough. Um, so the, the, the examples that I'm going to go over with you, I hope in the next 20 minutes, so we have some time for questions. Um, the examples are all activities that are grounded in shaping. They are meant to help you start out. They are designed around the process of giving something tangible for you and your supervisee to learn how to interact with one another and to learn how to make progress in a relationship that will serve your clients, your children, the families, and will also help make the next generation better so that they can engage in this in such different ways and in much more sophisticated and advanced problems. So what I'm gonna to describe to you is kind of a basic way of conceptualizing the process of dialoguing. And that's the first place where I think it is helpful to start. So learning how to dialogue about important topics that are going on in the world related to all of these issues, related to inclusion and to cultural responsiveness. But at first maybe doing it in a way that is not, um, that is not immediately uh, difficult. 
it is difficult. Just doing what I'm going to describe right now is difficult. So here's how the process works. First, you have some kind of presentation um, about the context and talk a little bit about meaning and parameters. So for example, we have presented that diagram I showed you earlier, which actually is called the hierarchy. Um, so we've talked about what that is. We've also talked about how oftentimes what's going on with people, you only see a little bit, the whole iceberg analogy, and that there may be a lot of other things going on underneath. So we talk a little bit about context. And the next thing we do is we take turns presenting some kind of stimulus. Children at the border being separated from their parents, Elijah McCain and being killed, uh, children dying from Syria on the shores of Greece. So we talk about those issues and I will tell you, so for example, all of these affect me deeply because of the communities I engage in. There will be other ones that I really don't know about. Each of us will have different uh, ways of responding to those stimuli. We usually show media because when you see something from YouTube or social media clip in time, it gives you a lot of rich information and people know different things about it, which is where the next part comes in. We engage in a process of collective shaping and we rely on the Nepantla. So each of us, has a different perspective. These are all of us. Sometimes it can be just you and your supervisee group. You can be talking about these things. You have a range of lived experience, affiliations, exclusions, oppressions, privileges. And what happens is you engage in a collective shaping process of your understanding of those situations, but you also learn how to talk about hard things. And I will tell you in the process of this, we have been doing this maybe for four or five years, and there have been a lot of insights and ahas, building of empathy, building of perspective, but there's also been a lot of hurt. We have had people that leave our community of practice and never come back. We have people, including myself, that leave sort of crying and then come back and say, okay, I'm going to try it again. Um, this is hard, but it is harder not to have the conversations and not to learn, especially um, when, well, for all of us, it's harder. So a lot of this work comes from Paulo Fieri and uh, liberation theology about dialoguing. And then we have had several uh, students who've done master's theses around these areas and actually several more in progress right now, looking at the process and they're all available online. So the second thing I would like to do, the second kind of step in the shaping process. You know, oh, actually, let me say. So when we talk about the topics, um, the things that we have focused on in our community of practice, which we call the community lab, is we've noticed a lot. We've worked a lot on just how to notice the feelings of other people who are different than ourselves. And that's actually harder than you would think. We all have different ways of showing expression. And some of those expressions actually mean different things. Um, we've also talked about how you notice and describe the, the dimensions of privilege, oppression, coercion, and attraction. We've talked about how you notice social injustices at an individual re relationship level, but also in our own communities and in the institutions where we work. We have worked a lot and had several, several students really focus on how do you develop genuine and meaningful relationships with people who are different than you um, in the context of interventions and how you just learn how to talk to each other when the stakes are really high. So the next step um, I'm going to talk about is how you create progressive supervision dialogues. So the process is kind of the same, that first you talk about context. And in the case of supervision, what you wanna talk about always is, okay, what is our relationship? What are the parameters? And we talk about that in our supervision book. Um, and what I'm going to add to that and what we talked about in the book is the choices for relationships over control of the person. And, and they're, it's not just semantics. It, it's talking about what happens to both of you as you interact and learn together. And that that learning and interacting together is directed by your common mission to serve the people you work with effectively and with dignity and respect. Um, 
this right here comes from something. There's actually a book called Skill Dialogue, which we rely a lot on. So again, we might talk about hierarchies. We might talk about this as a little diagram from the Skill Dialogue books. We also might talk about today we're going to look at our ethics code. What's included in there? What does that mean? And then we engage in a process of each of us sharing stimuli. And I'm going to talk about each of those. So this is actually a picture of me with my family when I was a teenager. Um, so sharing pictures is actually something that I learned from our anthropologist colleagues. It's a really beautiful SD to start a conversation and get to know people. We can also look at the text list. That's, that's something we can talk about. What are your expectations of what you want to learn in the supervision process? What will be the tensions around that, the values? We also may talk about responsibilities and methods. How are we going to get feedback? What are we going to do? And this little schedule right here, we'll talk about the communication process. Are we gonna to talk to each other? What are the logistics of our scheduling? Of course, we wouldn't do all this in one session. Um, these are just examples of how we might approach things and I'm gonna unpack those a little bit. Um, and then again, we enter to an uncomfortable space with respect, we try, and again, these are actual um, components that are operationally defined of the skilled dialogue process, where you welcome, you allow, you try to make sense, you try to appreciate the other person's perspective, and then you try to, that should actually be joining, um, you try to join perspectives and come up with third ways that meet both of your needs, but also do it in a way that still serves the mission of what you're trying to accomplish in the circuit supervision process. I will tell you an important thing that I've been learning is that all of these discussions, none of us are very good at them. And that especially your supervisees may not understand things about identity or where they are, um, no matter who they are. And it's a process of learning to talk about those things and learning to talk about those things in a safe environment that your supervisor has built and honors. So I'm gonna give you some examples. So one of the things we suggest in the book, which I think is very helpful um, and, and across the board for supervision because, but it becomes particularly important um, when you wanna be culturally responsive is have a mentoring tree. And I'm pretty sure that Tyra or Linda are both talked about it, but one of the things that you wanna do is you wanna talk about your own roots. Who were the people, I had a lot of people who influenced the way I practice as a behavior analyst um, in my early basic training, but also who I am as a human being. My parents, in my case, my aunts, my grandparents, and I had a mentor, Miss Whitaker, who were really formative in the way that I approach everything I do as a professional and as a person. Um, but then also to talk about, well, who are your mentors right now? And it's important to give this model to your supervisees and how all of those people, hopefully your list becomes a more and more diverse group of people from different cultural groups. So you can talk to your supervisee and model what you have learned and then have them do a tree and have them shape that tree over time. Even me looking at this list, which I did when we were writing the book and I added a little bit on, but I was looking at it tonight and I thought, oh, you know, there are layers here as I become more comfortable with sharing and safe, feel safe, sharing specifics about my own culture, which is different from the dominant culture, I would add different things here. So to teach your supervisee that it's an ongoing process for both of you. Another example is to talk about um, to talk about your personal history, having photographs, stories, talking about your feelings. This is actually my grandmother and my dad um, in, I think, 1927. And I, I can tell you a whole two hour story about this picture and what it means to me, what, what this picture up above them means. And it's very important to how I function as a behavior analyst and how I interact with the world. If you were supervising me, I would want you to know this and I would want to feel safe telling you. The other thing is having very specific discussions about values and expectations. Um, and this is hard. There, there's a group of scholars that talk about this as perspective taking and making. 
what you are doing is you are not only learning to understand the other person's perspective, but together you're making a perspective that includes both of you um, and becoming familiar with another human and learning where the connection points are and the opportunities for growth. This is a list of questions that we've suggested. And again, we try to be as open-ended as possible and as listening and welcoming as possible to understand where your supervisee is. The other thing that it's helpful to do, and it's incredibly difficult, is take the hot spots and the tensions head on. Um, and this, and again, a shaping pro process. I would not recommend doing this until you feel and your supervisee feels very safe in the relationship. But you want to talk about what pain and trauma there is. You know, issues related to gender are very difficult in our field right now. And there's a lot of polarity in how we're approaching it. So part of what you want to do is talk about, um, talk about those things. Talk about your own. Model it. Talk about your assumptions, because guess what? We have different assumptions about what things mean and what intent people mean. How do you demonstrate feelings? How important do you think they are? There are some cultures that think they're really important and then some cultures who feel like they're more regulated and less appropriate in professional situations. Those are things to discuss. Religious and spiritual practice. You know, majority of this country actually has spiritual practice. I'm using that term very broadly. And when we look at that as, as part of people's lives, that's a very difficult and sensitive area in behavior analysis. Talk about hierarchies, authority and rules. There are some cultural groups that don't feel comfortable, you know, with the supervisee initiating and saying, tell me what to do, give me more feedback. That feels rude. So you have to talk about how does that work? And surprisingly, the previous exercises, especially with the stories and the mentoring tree, when you hear examples and you ask more questions for follow-up and ask for more descriptions, specific situations, you'll start to learn a lot about these things before you even start touching them as specifics. Again, know that your supervisee, like you, will be in the process of learning to talk about these things. So you might, again, start with some things. Um, start with some things that are going on in the media. This was Mark Lamont Hill talking about the uprising last spring. Um, this is me talking with one of my supervisees about the experience they just had with a course I had and how it felt across two different cultures. Time is one that could be a whole workshop in itself, but talking about responses to time. There are very different ways um, across cultures to respond to time. And that actually ends up causing a lot of tension with people not even knowing that that's what's happening. Um, I think we have some really good descriptions of that in the book. The other thing is talking about how you're gonna communicate with one another. And one of the things that I've used is first have some just scenarios but first, let's talk about me interacting with the child and you and I talk about that, my supervisee and I, and kind of build our language, get an idea of how they feel comfortable responding and how you feel comfortable giving feedback to one another. So first you do it with you as a supervisor. Then you look at your supervisee and let's watch a clip of you interacting and then you practice. But at the same time, you're talking about the process of you engaging in the process. And then look at a clip of you giving feedback to each other and talking about this, it gets very matrix-like, but engaging in the process of giving feedback to one another and talk about that. With those scenarios, there are different topics you'll wanna to talk about and where you jump in will depend on you, it will be, depend on what you're doing, but in general, you want to feel comfortable knowing how each of you are going to respond and would like to respond to instructions, feedback, and practice. And that will vary with people with different conditioning histories. You also want to talk a little bit about um, comfort and effectiveness, how you want to be direct or not direct, how you want to initiate, what, what is respectful to you, 
what is dignified to you. I know one of the biggest cultural clashes I had was actually someone who has a similar cultural background, which threw me off because I felt like she responded to me in an incredibly disrespectful way. And as, as we didn't work through it and then work through it, and in hindsight, I feel like this discussion would have helped a lot. And I'm trying to have it a lot more with supervisees about these specific things. Um, the other thing is, again, communicate about communicating. Some of the questions you could ask, if it's difficult to say, well, how would your father have reacted in this situation? How would your high school teacher? How would your first um, employer reacted? How would you like this to happen? How should we have this happen together? So this is just kind of a really rough overview of some of the things, but the general idea is take it slow and gently, start with yourself um, and start with things that will be comfortable and safe for your supervisee to talk about. And again, ensure that you are responding in a safe way. I would recommend, if this seems at all difficult or intimidating, um, I think it's really important to practice with a peer first, with several peers. So those are the five areas of transformation, some examples. Um, and I wanna say, I'm gonna give you a couple of my reflections. I'm gonna do this really fast because I think we have about 15 minutes and I would like to leave some time for questions. So I think, first of all, this is something that I've come to understand as deep aesthetics. Um, and I see across all areas of social justice work, avoid facades. Um, performative is not good. In behavioral uh, conceptualization, basically it leads to mistrust and it signals ugly contingencies and hypocrisy. You want deep beauty. You want healthy, honest, forgiving, loving, and joyful interactions, what that signals to people when you're doing the real thing and really trying to grow yourself is it signals growth and beautiful contingencies. Also, and this is so hard, we all do it, I do it, avoid the bad people, good people trap. Remember, we all have a whole lot of behavior and we're all trying and we've all been conditioned in certain ways. I'm not bad, I'm not good. We are all trying to move forward and we all should be able to grow and change, which is hard. Our society really likes to vilify um, particular people. That's related a lot to nurturing trust. Um, people are not going to make progress unless they're in a safe and trusting environment to grow um, with some shared goals. Also, there's this concept in the, the cross-cultural literature of swaying, which is really hard because it looks like you're waffling when you're changing your mind, but there's a balance. You, you have to be able to move and to bend. You can't be too rigid. There's a whole lot of things you can reflect on and I would encourage you, this is the last slide, I would encourage you to reflect on those, to look at the discussion questions that I've created and maybe talk with your co-supervisees, your, your directors and talk about all of these things. Talk about where your starting point can be to increase your cultural responsiveness as a supervisor. I just want to say, and then I'm going to stop sharing. Um, I really have a lot of gratitude for my communities of practice. I have several and I won't read them all, but I want to say that each of these people has helped me progress in ways that I think are, um, are pretty amazing. And there are the follow-up activities. I also attach them in your packet as separate sheets. I'm going to stop sharing and I hope I can see some faces. <laughs> Hey, Shala. Great presentation. Our, our tech wasn't the greatest tonight, but hopefully everybody understands. I mean, one thing is we're coming out of this, this Zoom culture. We're going to be in person pretty soon here. So I'm looking forward to that. So we won't have to deal with it. But uh, the parts that I was able to listen to, because I was still dealing with things behind the scene, that were wonderful. I mean, this whole series has been wonderful. Thank you so much for doing it. I'm sorry for starting like we did. It's okay. You know what? I think 
I, I think actually it was good for this particular presentation because this is the name of the game. It's like, okay, freak out a little bit and then figure out how to make it work <laughs> um, and learn from it, you know? Um, right. So, anyway. you know, it, it's great. This is the fifth talk. We've had great feedback from all of the talks and I, and I know we're going to get great from this one. So this has been a wonderful thing for the BALC uh, to do. Uh, the format we're using is actually getting redirected to another platform, so there's a 20 second delay, which is why I'm stalling here for a little okay, bit. We're fine. waiting for some questions. <laughs> um, here's our workaround with this because I it actually logged me out of this platform, and I didn't want to do anything while you were talking because I was so afraid I was going to mess things up. So I had Megan on the phone beside the computer. Megan, any questions? Not yet. Not yet. No questions yet. So. Um, if you okay. do have a question, we'll give you about another minute to to put it out there. Um, I will say it's a lot of dense information. And I think, you know, one of the things I've understood is that I think so many things that we learn in our field, you know, there's a checklist for introducing a prompt and fading a prompt. Um, this isn't like that. This is very directional because we actually don't know what it's supposed to look like in the end. Partly, if we did, then it wouldn't be transformative and it would be a buy-in model to get everybody look, to look like the dominant culture in the way we deliver services and the way we supervise. So that makes it sort of a, I think, a hard area, but also a really exciting. It reminds me actually of 30 years ago when Jim and I were starting in graduate school and everything was kind of new in all discovery phase. Um, it was it was, we didn't know, you know, so, so maybe that's what's also attracted it to me as well as my own, my own identity. Um, what have these last three decades been like, Shala? You mentioned it 30 years ago. <laughs> like I'd say stumped her with that. <laughs> um, you know, I think in terms of culture, I think that First of all, I learned amazing things as a behavior scientist, as a behavior analyst, and I hope that I made a really big difference in a bunch of people's lives over that time. I think I also see as I kind of widen my perspective and also as I become aware more of the disparities of who we're serving and we're not serving, and I become more aware of also my own position and when I feel safe and not safe. And I'm, I'm in a funny position because I'm mixed. I'm brownish. Um, I'm kind of white passing. I'm kind of, I don't talk about having a really different religion than everybody else, or at least I didn't in the past. So I think part of what's happened is I find myself opening more, um, which also I think has helped me find a really good place and understand more about creating safe environments for my colleagues that um, have not experienced all the privileges. Exactly. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Was that the answer you expected? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Alrighty. So I want to, Ashala, I want you to hang on if, if you would while I'm moving to a different school. Let's see if I, my share is, is going to work at this point. Um, and I think it did. So you should be looking at a slide. I'm just reminding everybody, if you want your CEUs and you're watching this as a recorded version, you email CEU at BALCLLC.org with your name, your number, your the webinar title and the participation words. So that's it. It's been a great series. Uh, we started this way back in February and we've just ended with a wonderful presentation. Uh, the world is, is beginning to write itself again. So we hope everybody out there is well. Uh, thank you for attending and thank you for supporting the BLC. Thank you, Shala.